Okay, policing and punishment. This is actually a really big topic. Um, probably we could spend uh, at least a class on each of these issues. <clears throat> but what yokes them together is really that both the use of the state's police powers and the use of its powers to punish form part of a complex that has to do with the use of internal coercion. Fundamentally, this is the, you know, this is the bit from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where uh, they say, now you see the violence inherent in the system. Fundamentally, what makes a state a state, as opposed to some other kind of social organization, arguably at least, is its monopoly or near monopoly on the use of force. Now that doesn't mean that it's using force all the time, but it means that if you at least if you buy that sort of Weberian definition, in some sense the state's power is ultimately grounded in its <coughs> both ability to use force and in the presumed legitimacy of its use of force. And internally, where the rubber meets the road for that is in uh, the use of, at least in contemporary states, internally where the rubber meets the road is in the use of the police and of the, uh, the quote-unquote correctional system. Now, a couple of caveats about this. First, um, I'm going to talk about this from the background of uh, assuming that we're talking about policing and punishment in a democratic system. It's the one we live in. It's the most familiar. And it also is the one, frankly, that there's been the most literature devoted to understanding. <clears throat> also, again, largely uh, because of familiarity and because of the depth of the literature, this discussion will be a little bit US-centric. Um, I'm not as familiar with the way that policing works in other, other countries. But also, especially in the developing world where police reform is going on, Western models, in particular US models, are quite influential. So keep that in mind as we, uh, as we go through this. All right, so what are the big issues around the internal use of coercive force? Well, the first one, and the, this is the big one, the ultimate one, is that it seems, we'll talk a little bit about some criticisms of this apparent view, but at least on the straightforward view, it seems that Sometimes states just do need to use force to maintain order. But in a basically democratic kind of system, how do we reconcile that with consent? If the police shoot at me, presumably I don't want them to. Uh, and so how do we reconcile the idea that you can force me to do things with the idea that the political order's legitimacy in some way flows from consent? This gives rise to a number of different kinds of questions. One of them is just the simple question that's surprisingly difficult to, to nail down a straight answer to of what exactly are states doing when they use force internally? For instance, are they promoting morality? Are they preserving the order of the state? Are they preserving some kind of legitimate or illegitimate social hierarchy? What exactly is going on? It's may seem easy to say, oh, well, we have police so that they can punish you for breaking the law. But that papers over a lot of interesting and problematic distinctions. <clears throat> the police don't come for every infraction of the law, for instance. Um, they also don't react the same way to every infraction of the law. And so thinking about what exactly the point of having folks with guns who are somehow supposed to be connected with enforcement of the law, what's the point of having them, how should we calibrate their responses, how should we understand the legitimacy of their responses, even within a context where we say, well, they're there to come punish you if you break the law. Um, you know, we also do things like we give, we often give police discretion to not punish you. Uh, many of you probably have had the experience of committing especially traffic violations and having police you know, let you off with a warning. Why the heck would we have people who go around letting you off with warnings? It's actually a 
you know, police discretion is actually a serious question. I mean, if you're interested about Klein Inc. has a whole chapter on it that I didn't give you to read. Connect you with this. It's a question of why we punish people. Most crimes in the U.S. right now, the punishment is either you have to pay some money or you have to go to jail, or sometimes both of them. But there's a serious question about what exactly is this supposed to do? If I pay money for speeding, why exactly are you asking me to pay money? Why is it ex this particular amount? If I go to jail for having marijuana on me, why exactly are you sending me to jail? What is this supposed to do? What are we hoping to accomplish by, by punishing people in these ways? And why have we seemed to have decided, for instance, in our society that flogging people uh, is not going to accomplish the purposes we want out of punishment? And finally, and sort of the deeper question is, uh, what should the relationship be between coercion and other ways of solving social problems? In some sense, the point of having police and punishment systems is supposed to be to solve certain kinds of problems that would otherwise arise in society. <clears throat> if you remember back in the, in the social contract tradition that dominates a lot of political philosophy, the whole point of having a state at all is to solve certain kinds of problems that would arise in social groups if we did not have some kind of coercion-wielding bureaucracy to organize, coordinate, deconflict, and that sort of thing. But of course, using force is only one element that you can use for solving social problems. In fact, probably most of us Probably most people listening to this to, to, to this uh, discussion, for most of us, probably, use of force is going to be an extremely rare occurrence in our lives. Now, I say that with the caveat because, of course, most of us, people listening to this, we're probably relatively affluent, generally speaking. And one of the characteristics of certainly American society, um, also a lot of relatively affluent democratic societies, is that if you are poorer, use of force is likely to be a much larger component of your day-to-day -day life. Um, you're much more likely to encounter coercive tactics by the police. You're much more likely to encounter violent people in your everyday life. <coughs> For the relatively affluent, it's pretty rare. We get through most of our lives without ever using force. Um, and it's, it's actually usually pretty shocking and, 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 uh, and rattling for, you know, middle class, upper middle class, wealthy folks in the United States to, to encounter the use of force. Um, somehow, there's two, two aspects of this, right? One of them is, why is this? Maybe this is problematic that violence is a much, even state violence is a much bigger part of the day to day for people who are lower down the socioeconomic ladder. The second is, what is the show? Maybe there are other ways, maybe, maybe we could get away with lots of other tactics besides using coercion to solve some of the problems that we currently use coercion for. This is at least sort of the the utopian optimistic picture of things. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm going to I'm going to die of the crud that uh, that that I get from my students. So, thank you guys. Okay. So, what are police for? Let's start with this question. Um Kleinig gives four different options. Uh, he, I think his policy orientation leaves off one, um, though maybe it's a sort of a subcategory. So the first, and in some ways the most straightforward kind of, uh, of notion, is that police are there to fight crime. They're there to stop crime. This is sort of the, the, the forward-looking policy orientation view of things, um, at least. They don't, they're not there to solve problems in some broader sense. Uh, that might be the proper role of somebody else. <coughs> you know, it's not that we don't want to do it, it just might be somebody else's proper role. Um, they're there precisely to stop violations of the law, to prevent, to, to largely to prevent and halt them, possibly also to punish them. Kleining doesn't focus on the police's connection to punishment that closely, but of course, this is another pretty straightforward understanding of it. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure if I asked my four-year-old, well, what, are, what do police do? Some, I'd get some version of, uh, you know, well, if you, if you do something wrong, they punish you, right? Now, of course, in our society, and in most societies, police typically, at least when they're acting within the law, don't mete out the punishment themselves, right? Of course, this happens. But at least in our society, we usually consider this you know, sort of police brutality of, of some form. That may be relatively recent, even in our society. Um, Peter Moskos has a book called Cop in the Hood. He's a sociologist who spent a year serving with the Baltimore City Police. And he talks about how when he would speak to older police officers, back in the day, it was much more accepted for, especially for sort of minor infractions, or um, for repeat offenders, for police to mete out quote-unquote street justice on the spot, right? If somebody was causing problems in the community, they might just go beat him up uh, instead of arresting him or whatever. That is generally frowned upon now. Uh, I take it even within police departments, uh, not just outside of them. So generally speaking, police don't directly punish, but for a lot of people, one of their main functions is to grab people who are lawbreakers and funnel them into the punishment system to ensure that they're punished. Now, Kleinig, like I said, he's enough of a policy guy that uh, he focuses primarily on the forward-looking aspects of this, even with punishment, right? You're, you're punishing people largely to deter future crime. For a lot of people, I suspect, though, it's also, you know, the pure punishment function punishing bad things is part of what they understand police to be police to be doing. Um, we'll get to the, the role of punishment in a moment. <coughs> okay. A slightly more expansive picture of what police are supposed... No, sorry, before I go into the more expensive one. This is a very limited role for police, but for instance, it's also a role that is very consonant because of its limits with more limited pictures of the state. This is a role for police that libertarians, um, for instance, probably are going to favor in some way. The police are there to deal with people who violate the right to life and violate the right to property and contract. That's why we have the state in the first place. It's the only legitimate function for them. They shouldn't get worried about anything else. Um, even non-libertarians might think this is pretty much should be the very limited role we give to the people who are authorized to use force in some way. Everything else should be dealt with some, by somebody else. All right. So a slightly more expansive picture of police, and actually a quite expansive picture. These, these don't go sort of in a nice ascending order of expansiveness. With that police are fundamentally emergency responders. They fight crime. That's part of it. They, they deal especially with violent criminals. But their ability and authorization to use force also gives them a role as general purpose people to deal with dangerous or unstable situations. So on this kind of view, police might be the first ones in to difficult or dangerous situations, at least situations that are, diffi that are difficult or dangerous because somebody in them is, is, using, is using force. Um, and they go in first because they're able to protect themselves. So they might not be the best negotiators, but they go into a situation where negotiation is needed before it's safe for non-armed negotiators to go in. They might not be the best medics, but they go into a situation where somebody needs medical attention um, before anyone else because they are the ones who can protect themselves if, you know, people need medical attention because there's a fight, and so uh, an, an EMT might get hurt. On this sort of view, they're, they're sort of jack-of-all-trades. Um, they might be masters of none. They're masters only of uh, use of coercion. But we keep them around to deal with situations, to stabilize them well enough for other kinds of more appropriate personnel to get involved. This, in a sense, doesn't give them a terribly distinctive role in society. 
um, it gives them a, a more a, a more generic role and uh, basically makes them a stand-in in a lot of situations for other kinds of social servants. Kleinig, I think, rightfully thinks this is a little bit weird way of thinking about police. There's a little bit more coherence to their role than this. So um, a different way of thinking about them is that, no, really, the use of force is more key than this, but they're not just there to fight crime. You know, we expect police to do all sorts of other things besides just deter and punish crime. And the more expensive role might be a kind of use of force to preserve order. On this kind of view, we say, let's, let's not expect or require or legitimate police getting their noses into all sorts of social problems there might be, requiring all sorts of tactics. Um, their role is to use force, but their mandate is a bit broader. Their mandate is to be the people who use force when order needs to be preserved. This might be because there's a crime happening, but it might be in situations where there are no crimes, where what's going on is not criminal, or where the crime is not sort of the main focus. So for instance, large gatherings of people, demonstrations, protests, this sort of thing. Protests are not a crime, but police might have a role in this sort of thing, um, even before a you know, protests, of course, can lead to crimes, right? So fighting crime police might come in to put down a riot, because riot's a crime. But um, this is a bit of a broader mandate. This is, you know, a protest where nothing bad has happened is not yet a crime, but the police might be have a role to use force to ensure that crimes don't happen, to corral protesters in ways uh, that prevent them from causing too much social disruption. Um, they might also be authorized to use their force in more subtle ways to to um, maintain order. Um, you know, making people move along who are loitering, move through areas where there's no specific crime they're responding to, but maybe are high drug areas as a show of force uh, to try to convince people not to get involved in anything. Um, shut down domestic disputes, that sort of thing. A somewhat broader notion is to say, well, let's not make the use of force central to our understanding of the police role. Let's make this preserving order idea central to our understanding of the police role, but understand that police can use a variety of tactics, including but not limited to force in order to do this. This is Kleinig's notion of the social peacekeeper. And this is very much in line with <coughs> what you might see refer to as community, community policing concepts. So the primary role for the police on this, I, on, on this view is to maintain the peace in a much more eclectic and in some ways deeper manner than the use force to preserve order concept. On this kind of view, police are troubleshooters of social conflict. They are mediators. They are negotiators. Um, they're problem solvers they should proactively try to find situations that may lead to a breakdown in order or a breakdown in the peace and resolve them. And on this kind of view, while police are authorized to use force and have the, are trained and have the ability to, use, they have the training and the equipment to use force, this is the kind of model on which uh, folks talk about you know, if a police officer fires her weapon, that's a failure. It shows that there's been a breakdown. Um, this kind of model is much more friendly to the idea of the police officer who will get to know everyone in her area of operations so that she can identify and defuse problems before they become problems. Now, the authorization to use force may be important, even if the police officer never uses it. Um, the authorization may be important because she may be especially needed in areas where the problems are likely to erupt into violence or danger. But her role is not to preserve the peace by using force. Her role is to preserve the peace using whatever tactics are necessary. <clears throat> 
there is a significant policy tension. I think in a lot of ways, the fighting crime model, the pure fighting crime model, is not one that has a lot of traction in most contemporary democratic policing theory. But there's a significant tension both among theorists and among policymakers between varieties of the use force to preserve order kind of model and the preserving the peace through a variety of tactics kind of model. The latter focuses on community policing, focuses on mediation, focuses on um, use of discretion, focuses on um, police becoming part of the community they're in. The former focuses on um, disrupting dangerous networks. It focuses on use of um, paramilitary-style tactics, at least in the current current U.S. You know, matching the force available to violent elements with force available to the police. Um, favors the creation of uh, SWAT units. Um, one of the characteristics of contemporary policing, for instance, in the U.S., is that 30, 40 years ago, uh, SWAT units, these are special weapons and tactics units, the folks with the battering rams and the rifles and, you know, snipers and, and, and tear gas grenades and all sorts of stuff. This was extremely rare, uh, used only for crisis situations, um, used only in situations where there is an extreme threat. Now, this is much more common. It's much more common for those that kind of equipment to be available to a broader array of police officers and to be used in a much more general sort of way. One of the things that I think uh, Kennedy mentions is that it's now become almost standard operating procedure to go armed, go with a SWAT unit or equipped similarly to a SWAT unit for almost any kind of drug bust, right? Um, living in Baltimore, I can give you an anecdotal example, right? There was a drug house on my on my street. Uh, I've walked. I had walked by it. I'd actually sort of nodded and said hello to the people who turned out to be the to be the drug dealers. Um, there was no particular evidence that this was you know a heavily armed nest of drug traffickers or narco terrorists. Nonetheless, standard operating procedure was when the police finally dealt with the house. They went in with full armor battering rams, uh, you know, assault rifles, and, uh, and, you know, and the whole, the whole shebang. So there's been a shift and there's a tension both with an analysis of police and to some extent within police departments themselves over um, how to do this. <clears throat> Baltimore, again, is a, is a case in point. We've, we've shifted policing strategy between, <clears throat> pardon me, between uh, early 2000s Ed Norris was our police commissioner. Uh, zero tolerance policing was the order of the day. Strong emphasis on paramilitary style tactics to now uh, under uh, Bielfeld, the shift towards community policing, mediation, community prosecution, that sort of thing. So to some extent, that fight is where a lot of the policy rubber meets the road. And of course, lurking in the back of everything here is the war on drugs, at least in the US to some extent in Europe um, and other places, but in the U.S. lurking in the back of everything here is the war on drugs. All right, similarly, we might ask, well, what's what's punishment for? Once someone has been apprehended by the police power of the state for committing a crime, what exactly are we doing when we, when we put them into the quote-unquote correctional system? <clears throat> the, I don't know what I'm gonna say classical, a very traditional account, this is Kant's account, is that punishment is essentially a kind of balancing of moral accounts. It just is moral for someone who has harmed another person or harmed society to be harmed in turn. Uh, Kant thinks that the lex talionis, the eye for an eye, is really the only way to do this. So, um, you know, if someone has stolen, they're fined. Uh, if someone has, you know, uh, harmed someone, they maybe receive corporal punishment. If someone has killed someone, we execute them. And 
the whole reason is that just morality demands this kind of balancing. It's not about deterring future crime. It might have that as a side effect, right? Um, it's not about. It's not even about something like bringing closure to the victims. It might, again, it might have that as a side effect. Victims might feel that they have closure because they have seen justice be done. But fundamentally, it's about justice being done for its own sake. Uh, this is why Kant makes that that perhaps seemingly bizarre comment about how if a society on an island is going to break up. <clears throat> They need to make sure that they execute all of any any murderers they haven't got around to executing yet. They execute them all before they leave, because otherwise it's immoral. It is immoral not to balance the accounts in this kind of way. Um, if you are now, I think this is this actually is tied up with a lot of our thinking. This is this is a very straightforward version of what's sometimes called retributivism punishment is about retribution for the wrong done. And a lot of people may not, in contemporary society, think of it in as explicitly metaphysical and moralistic a way as Kant did. But this certainly affects a lot of our thinking about the way we set up our penal system. Um, it just makes sense to a lot of people that punishment should fit the crime in some way. The worst crime you commit the longer you should go to jail, or the heavier fine you should pay. We don't, in our society, use a kind of lex talionis, you know, we don't you know, flog people who commit assault or, um, you know, or that sort of thing. But the vestige of the thinking remains in the basic idea that punishment should somehow fit the crime. And this can often lead to a resistance to certain kinds of policies that violate that. So whatever you think about the rights of um, intellectual property, there are often complaints that the penalties for doing things like illegally downloading movies are massively out of whack with the badness of it, right? Most of us probably, again, many of you listening to this probably don't really think of illegally downloading movies as, as, as wrong at all. There are lots of people who just don't really see it as wrong. Even people who see it as wrong, it tends to be the sort of thing that people see as wrong, but, you know, wrong like speeding is wrong. Or um, wrong like illegally parking is wrong. Um, it's, it's wrong, maybe, but it's not a really horrible, horrible crime. Right? Most of us, you know, many, I don't know about most of us, many of us, for instance, if we found out that someone we knew was a rapist, we would probably shun them. You know, we would not feel comfortable hanging out with them. We would think of them as a bad person. Most of us probably know, even if you think it's wrong, most people probably know people who illegally download music or movies or whatever. Um, you know, it's not like you think, wow, I can't hang out with that guy. He illegally downloads movies. That's so horrible and odious, right? So the fact that um, the financial penalties for having illegally downloaded movies are so high, hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases, makes a lot of people think this is, this is really out of whack. Now, the argument would be it's so hard to catch people who do this that the penalty needs to be very high in order to have a deterrent effect. And that might be reasonable, it might even be true, but for a lot of people, the intuitive sense is that it's still, it's unreasonable to penalize someone so heavily uh, for a rel what's seen as a relatively minor crime. Okay. So, nonetheless, even if you, you know, even if this is sort of tied up with our idea, with our sort of intuitive ideas about the severity of the punishment being calibrated to the badness of the crime, if you don't want to go quite so metaphysical as that, you might think of punishment as, in some way, symbolizing societal judgment. Uh, this is sometimes called an expressive view. And this, again, can be contrasted with things like deterrent views. So, on this kind of view, take something like the war on drugs. There are The reason it is difficult for me to find policy students who like the war on drugs is that most of us are trained in things like cost-benefit analysis. 
And the data on cost-benefit analysis for the war on drugs looks pretty grim for the most part. Uh, war on drugs has been going on for a while. Nonetheless, drugs still around. Lots of people in prison, lots of money spent, doesn't seem to be working that well. However, for a lot of people, if you said, okay, well, let's just decriminalize drugs, policy students tend to love that idea. Lots of other people don't. And part of the reason is that the war on drugs might have an expressive effect. Again, not everyone may think this through all that clearly, but even if you don't think that, for instance, um, being a heroin user is a tremendous moral failing, like, you know, it's not like murdering somebody, you might think that decriminalizing it would send the wrong message. It's a way of saying society doesn't care if you do this. And a lot of people want to say, no, society does care if you do this. So a different kind of understanding of punishment, um, and these things can often be blended, but a different strand at least of understanding of punishment is that it's expressive. By assigning punishments to certain kinds of actions, even if they're hard to catch, even if um, punishing in this way doesn't stop them, we are essentially saying as a society, we do not approve of this. This is wrong. This is bad. All right. A different kind of view, and now, now we start getting into the ones that tend to be more favored by policy students. A different kind of view is that <clears throat> punishment is there to effect moral or psychological reform. This is the classical correction concept of punishment. Um, the Quakers who built some of the first modern-ish prisons in the U.S. This was their idea. Now, it didn't work that well because the Quakers basically put everyone in solitary confinement for the length of their service. The idea was okay. The idea was this gives them time to think about what they've done. Uh, the effect was largely to drive people insane. But, you know, you can get behind the idea to some extent. On this idea, punishment is for the good of the person being punished. This is, for instance, how a lot of people think about punishing their own children, right? You're not punishing your child necessarily to balance moral accounts, right? That seems weird for like a six-year-old who doesn't have full moral agency. You're punishing them to help them become a better person. You put the child in time out so they can think about what they've done. Um, you know, you... Even people who favor corporal punishment of children might say, well, you know, I, I give a spanking to my child so that he realizes um, how harmful whatever he did was, how unacceptable it was. Um, on the large-scale form, this is the kind of model of punishment that favors, you know, education for prisoners, having folks come in and teach them vocational skills or get them to pass their GED. Uh, on this kind of picture, the period of punishment, and this is especially associated with the use of prisons as punishment, but not entirely. Corporal punishment is often, has often been thought of in this way. But in this kind of picture, community service too can be thought of this way. In this kind of picture, the punishment is an opportunity for reform. We design the punishment in such a way as to encourage people who go through it to not break the law anymore to not do wrong things anymore. Um, so, you know, we educate them so that they can get a non-criminal job uh, once they've left. Uh, we have them do community service so that they can feel less alienated, build more ties to the community. We um, give them time alone so they can reflect and contemplate the nature of their deeds. All those sorts of things fit in with a reformist correctional um, concept of what we're doing when we're punishing people. Or we might think that punishment is not about the criminal at all. Punishment is about redressing the harm done to another person or to society. <coughs> so in this kind of model, I don't necessarily care whether you become a better person uh, as a result of your punishment. Your punishment is intended to undo as far as possible whatever kind of damage you've done to society. So most straightforward sort of thing would be uh, if you've stolen something, well, we make you give it back or we make you give back um, uh, something equal in value. 
right? So this would be sort of if, if someone's a thief, we you know we find them a hundred dollars and give the hundred dollars to the person that 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 she stole from. Uh, there may be some kinds of things that you can't undo, right? You can't undo a murder. You can't undo a rape. You can't undo, um, you know, uh, an assault. That sort of thing. But there might be a kind of at least partial or more metaphorical redress that can happen here. So think about the death penalty in the U.S. Some people talk about the death penalty as fundamentally about balancing moral accounts. Murderers deserve to die, period. But if you think of the death penalty as useful primarily because, and I understand there's dispute about whether it works, right? But if your justification for the death penalty is primarily that it brings closure to the family of the people th that you killed. This is a kind of redress concept, right? It's not about you. It's not about the abstract moral accounts. It's about doing something to at least partly compensate the people who were harmed. You can't bring someone back to life, but you can at least give satisfaction to their family. That sort of thing. An even more policy-friendly thing is to say, look, I, we don't care about uh, any kind of redress. We're not looking to make people better people. What we want to do is deter future violations. So there might be other sorts of things. Um, you know, maybe we make people better. Maybe we give people education to get them better jobs, not because we think there's any sort of inherent value in reform, just because we know that if you get better jobs, then you're less likely to commit crimes. Um, we calibrate the punishments to whatever level uh, affects people's calculations, right? This is the kind of argument that, look, we need the death penalty, not because it brings closure, not because it puts some sort of moral account, but because we really, really want people not to murder, and so we need a really, really harsh penalty so that when you pick up, you know, whatever, you pick up that garrot, you're ready to eliminate your enemies in the Senate, um, you think, wow, I would, I would really like to become emperor of Rome, but um, no, they got seized with knives. Anyway, I'm probably thinking of like HBO version of Rome, right? Anyway, you've, I'd really like to, you know, become kingpin of my drug organization, but man, I really don't want to be executed, right? So it's a deterrent effect. It's all about making you change your criminal calculation. And then finally, you might think that all of this is way too highfalutin. Um, even deterrent is very difficult to predict, and certainly, you know, moral reform is something that, hey, that's outside the bounds of policy, outside the bounds of what the state should be involved with, um, especially if you have a system where prison is the kind of default punishment, as it is in ours, you might think that the punishment system, the penal system, is primarily just about segregating dangerous individuals from the rest of the population. We're not going to change murderers into good people. We just want to make sure that they're not around anyone else they can murder. We're not going to change thieves into good people. We just want to make sure they're not around anyone they can steal from. We're not going to, ref you know, get drug users to stop using drugs. We just want to remove them from the situation where there are drug markets. Um, Jonathan Simon, in his uh, very interesting book, Governing Through Crime, calls this the waste management model of, uh, of, of the correctional system. On this kind of view, you're not really doing anything either for the people in the correction system or directly for the victims of crimes. Which the model is basically based on the idea that there are some people who are criminals for whatever reason. We want them not to be part of our society. Uh, in an earlier age, this would be exile. In the contemporary age, we usually put them in prison. And the idea is that whatever else goes on in the prison, at least they're not in society harming other people. So, probably pretty obviously, um, what kind of model, what kind of concept of punishment you have, and again, these can often get blended together, right? You might think that you are trying to um, reform people, but an important part of that reform is balancing the moral accounts so that they understand sort of how morality works. But what you emphasize, um, how you structure, how, what you emphasize in your concept of punishment is going to affect how you think that the, the structure of punishments and the penal system in your society ought to be organized.
All right. In all of this, um, there's a lot of stuff that police might do. There's a lot of stuff the penal system might do. But uh, because we're focusing on this as an element of internal coercion, what role does force play in whatever system you have? Now, of course, the answer is going to depend to some extent on how you think the system ought to be put together. If you have a reformist model of policing, if you have a community, community policing model of policing coupled with a reformist model of the penal system, so, you know, sort of standard issue, squishy, lefty, liberal, kumbaya kind of concept, um, you're going to probably have a very de-emphasized role for force, and you're going to limit it in various kinds of ways, right? If you have a um, preserve order through force model of policing combined with a retributivist notion of punishment, so standard issue, fire and brimstone, you know, right wing, shoot them all and let God sort them out later concept of society, you're going to have a much more emphasized role for force. Um, you're probably going to see it as um, a much more central tool in the policing and punishment toolkit. All right, so the first thing is, but there's a number of considerations that are going to go into this that are worth keeping in mind. Uh, one is that force is either a necessary evil or it is something that might be good in of itself. So if you have a retributivist notion, the use of force in a lot of cases might be good in itself. It might be just be merited to inflict pain, suffering, or death on people who have broken certain kinds of laws. Uh, you know, the the stories of administering street justice may fall into this kind of category where, you know, this, there, there, there may have been police who just thought of this as these are bad people who deserve a beating to teach them a lesson. Um, it's not a kind of thought process where you say, wow, I wish there was a different way of teaching them this relevant lesson, um, except for beating them. No, the idea on this kind of model is that the beating is the lesson. What you are teaching them is precisely that, you know, pain and suffering is merited by inflicting pain and suffering on other people. A different kind of view, and uh, the one associated with almost all of the non-retributivist uh, notions, is that force is a tool, often a last resort tool, for achieving other kinds of social goals. Um, generally speaking, we're not using force because we want to use force. We're using force because we want to accomplish something else. Um, but sometimes force is the only way to do it. You also need to calibrate the level of force to your social aims. This is a kind of proportionality constraint. We'll talk a lot more about proportionality when we get to warfare, but this is why Kleinig has the whole chapter about things like when can you use handcuffs, when can you use batons, when can you use pepper spray, when can you use car chases, right? Car chases, much more dangerous than than firefights in terms of um, well the individual car chase may not be as dangerous as the individual firefight but a lot more people die from police use of car chases than they do from police use of firearms um, so even if there is some social goal in view whatever goal you think policing and punishment should have and you could achieve it by the use of force um, that use of force needs to be proportional to what you're achieving. You know, you don't want to engage in a very dangerous high-speed car chase because someone ran a stop sign, probably. A broader issue here is that fundamentally, in a lot of ways, in the domestic context, uh, using force, decisions about when and how and whether to use force, are largely about how you're going to distribute risk and there's sort of three categories that, you know, schematically you might want to think about here. <clears throat> On the one hand, you have uh, the criminals or the, the putative criminals, right? One thing that's always worth keeping in mind for police use of force is that these are people who it is typically not absolutely certain that they have committed a crime. Now, but it's actually some a lot of stuff about due process of law that we're actually not going to... I'm not going to talk about too much here, but we can talk about it in class if you guys are interested in that aspect of things. So, morally speaking, 
you know, not bracketing the legal questions about due process. Morally speaking, there might be some cases where police really do know that someone has committed a crime. But one thing that's characteristic of policing is that you often don't know, and in fact, we're often, we often are more sure than we ought to be about those sorts of things. So it's not as if you can straightforwardly answer risk balancing questions by saying, we'll put all the risk on the criminal because you may be dealing with people that, that actually are not criminals, right? So you've got one group is sort of the, the apparent, putative, presumed, seem to be criminals. Another group is all of the other citizens around. And a third group is the police themselves. So decisions about how police are going to be permitted to use force are often decisions about how the risk is going to be distributed among those three groups. Very restrictive rules about the use of force, for instance, are often seen as shifting a lot of risk onto the police. Whereas very permissive rules may shift risk away from the police themselves, you know, because they can fire their weapon or use their baton or use their pepper spray or whatever whenever they feel threatened. But that may transfer risk onto the, the the apparent criminals, which is problem. I mean, this is popular among a lot of police because you know nobody wants to be at risk. But it might be a problem from a policy perspective, both because the apparent criminals may not actually be criminals, but also because whatever they've done may not, in general, merit the kind of force that is visited upon them. Um, Kleinig has this whole discussion of fleeing fel rules about whether or not you can use force on fleeing felons, right? And one of the problems is that if you use lethal force against a fleeing felon, you might very well kill him or her. Most felonies don't have the death penalty, right? So you, you, you don't just want to blithely say all the risk should be on the person who we think has committed a felony. The other sort of problem, of course, is if police have very permissive rules rules for the use of force. This potentially, this shifts a lot of risk onto other people around who there may have no connection with the crime, right? If police are just shooting willy-nilly, this endangers bystanders and other sorts of folks. Um, you know, so uh, again, depressing Baltimore case in point, last summer there was a dispute at a nightclub. Uh, it turned out that um, well, there's a whole long story about it. Part of it was that one of the people involved in the dispute was an off-duty police officer who was armed, but uh, the other police who responded to the scene didn't know that he was a police officer. Uh, there ended up being a somewhat confused firefight that nobody's quite figured out exactly who was shooting at who. Not only was the off-duty police officer killed, but um, a guy who just was going to the club was killed, who didn't seem to have been involved in any, part, in, in any sort of violence. So whenever you have permissive rules, you may be um, decreasing risk to the police, but you're doing it at the cost of shifting it onto other citizens and onto the putative criminals. So um, deciding how you're going to set the rules for use of force is in a lot of ways about distribution of risk. And of course, there are deep moral questions about distribution of risk. Um, on the one hand, police officers seem to voluntarily assume some risk, uh, you know, but not infinite unlimited risk. Uh, criminals, we might say, implicitly accept some risk by being involved in criminal activity, but what about people who, you know, just happen to be mistaken for criminals or happen to be near criminals? Um, there's a sense in which, for instance, allowing very permissive use of force by police, it makes living in my neighborhood that not that much more risky, but it makes living in a poor neighborhood significantly more risky. And it's not clear that that's morally warranted. Okay. And finally, one thing to keep in mind, and, you know, especially with the events of the past year or so in the U.S., uh, there's a lot of focus on non-lethal force. Pepper spray, batons, locks, you know, various kinds of things. But, of course, non-lethal force can actually still be quite harmful. People can die from it. Uh, even, you know, even though it's supposed to be, quote-unquote, non-lethal, um, you know, there's a, there was a case uh, in New Jersey where police responding to a, to a mistaken medical alert call tased a, uh, an older, an older African-American man, um, and he died of heart failure from the electric shock. 
uh, people die from respiratory failure from tear gas, even if they're not killed, these things can often be quite painful or harmful. Um, I have fortunately never been sprayed with pepper spray, and I hope that it will never happen to me because it sounds extremely unpleasant. Um, you know, even if it's not going to kill me, um, it may not be warranted to just willy-nilly harm people, um, and it can also still be humiliating. And this might be something that we that we need to concern ourselves with, right? Um, one thing that's come up with. Uh, all the discussion about Trayvon Martin in Florida has been the fact that um, in a lot of areas there is still at least a perception of bias against uh, young African American men by the police and as a result they can be manhandled in various ways in a way that is not familiar to non-young African American men people in the US Uh, I am unlikely to be stopped and frisked uh, in general. Other people, uh, you know, if, if I was an 18 to 35 year old African American male, probably I would have been stopped and frisked several times. Now, stopping and frisking someone is not going to harm them in a really strong way. It's typically not painful. It's not going to kill them. But it can still be humiliating, uh, especially if it happens repeatedly. It is a forceful kind of kind of thing. It's like you, you do not get to say no to. Um, it can involve some sort of rough handling. Uh, something that might be a little bit closer to home for folks, uh, for a lot of the folks listening to this. Think about things like complaints about TSA screening, right? If I refuse to go through the backscatter machine and the uh, TSA screener uh, runs their hands all over intimate parts of my body, that's uh, not going to hurt me probably. But it can be pretty humiliating, and we might not think it's justifiable to inflict humiliation even on members of the population. All right, I need to move this along probably. All right, so another kind of question that comes up in thinking about how to set the policy, and that can underlie some of the decisions about use of force, say, is there's a deeper question about whether crime, especially violent crime, um, well, actually, the two big ones here are violent crime and drug crime in the U.S., whether it's an evil, a moral evil, or something more like a pathology, something more like a disease. There are a lot of folks, especially academics, who see crime essentially as like a disease rather than as a moral failing. Uh, a few weeks ago for Baltimore Youth Violence Prevention Week, I went to hear a panel involving um, Gary Slutkin, who was one of the chief architects of uh, Chicago's ceasefire program for reducing youth violence, uh, especially gang violence. Uh, Slutkin, one of the themes of his talk was that we know, he thinks, he argues, that we, we have a lot of good knowledge about what kinds of policies actually reduce violence. Um, but we are reluctant to use them because many of them don't involve treating people as committing moral evils that need to be punished. They involve treating people as if they had a disease. Um, And his basic argument, not to put too fine upon it, his basic argument was, this is dumb. Uh, You know, he, he is trained as a public health person, trained as an epidemiologist, and his position is basically, crime is a social disease. Um, like anything, like any, but it's like any other disease. You stop the transmission. You don't punish the sufferers. Now, on the one hand, um, there's a lot that drives this kind of view. People who are sympathetic to Slutkin are often sympathetic. Uh, in part, you know, they may be sort of data-driven sympathetic, but morally, but morally sympathetic, they may be because. If you see crime primarily as a moral failing, then this risks ignoring lots of social conditions that contribute to crime. So an easy way to think about this would be to say, look, if you see crime as a moral failing, you've got, a, you've got an interesting question about things like, you know, why is it that there is so much less crime in my neighborhood, Charles Village in Baltimore, than there is in a neighborhood like Sandtown, Winchester, right? Uh, If you don't want to say a significant part of the explanation is poverty, 
it's, it's hard to make sense of it, right? It's it would be a little bit weird for me to. I mean, it's a little bit implausible for me to say, well, you know, I just think that the people who live in Charles Village in general are morally better than the people who live in Sandtown, Winchester, right? Um, that seems a little bit implausible, and also in the exact con in the particular context where Charles Village is predominantly white and Sandtown, Winchester is predominantly black, you know, may even be 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 frankly be racist. Um, you know, so it seems like you are potentially missing something important if you say, no, crime is just a moral failing. It's not about whether you live in poverty. It's not about whether you live with discrimination. It's not about whether you live in a violent area or, you know, th th that sort of thing. Um, so this is a pressure towards seeing crime as a kind of social pathology. You know, crime is, is more like something you catch uh, than something you choose to do. On the other hand, if you see crime purely as a pathology, you risk deprotagonizing people, dehumanizing them. Uh, Thomas Hill, who is a Kantian, has written about the death penalty. And uh, he is pro-death penalty uh, on Kantian grounds. And he fleshes out this sort of Kantian idea that, that you need the death penalty to balance moral accounts by essentially, by, by essentially saying, the reason why the death penalty is moral is that not executing a murderer would be a moral insult to the murderer. You know, what Hill says is, if I killed someone, if I murdered someone, I would want you to execute me. Right? I would think that it was merited. So if, I do, if we don't execute a murderer, we are saying to them, oh, you're not, you're not fully human. You're not really responsible. We're not treating you as a truly autonomous individual. On a more down-to-earth kind of level, you might flip around my example of a place like Sandtown Winchester. You might say, well, what about all the people in Sandtown Winchester who don't commit crimes, right? Are we saying there's nothing different about them from the people who do commit crimes? It seems like if we say crime is a pathology, it's just something you catch, well, that, makes, that sort of makes sense out of why there's less crime in my neighborhood than there is in, in a, a poverty-stricken neighborhood. But it seems to... If we can't blame the people in Sandtown, Sandtown Winchester who do commit crimes, we also can't praise the people in Sandtown Winchester who don't commit crimes. Right? We can't recognize their holding to a moral standard despite being in a difficult position. So... Seeing crime purely as a kind of pathology risks draining people of their moral character, and that seems problematic to a lot of folks. The side issue about this is how this feeds into what you're going to do about crimes and social disorder and social disruption. Um, one of the reasons for looking at crime and social disruption as a kind of pathology is that... Um, Enforcement is harmful. Uh, using the tools of enforcement typically is bad for the people that it's being used against. Maybe not in some broader moral sense, but in the in the immediate sense. Uh, Kennedy, I think not in the excerpt I give you, but elsewhere in the book, he's talking about, um, you know, using crime, using the model of epidemiology for crime. And he says, look, one of the reasons why, you know, he says one of the big differences between treating diseases and treating crime is that um, if you have a disease, if you have cancer, we don't bust down the door and shoot the dog. And part of the point here is that there's two sides to this pathology sort of thing. On the one hand, it might seem to, if you see crime as a kind of pathology, it might seem to do well with understanding why crime happens to some people and not to other people, why some people become criminals and not others, in a way that does not place an implausible burden on their own inherent moral character. On the other hand, if you drain moral responsibility out of the picture, one of the problems is that lots of the things that we do to stop crime, to interrupt crime, when we use coercion, intuitively for a lot of people, they're only merited if somebody has deserved them in some way. So if I'm going to bust down your door 
and shoot your dog and you know make you lie on the ground and handcuff you and probably rough you up put a gun in your face all the, all this sort of thing um if we see crime as something you've done that's wrong this might seem warranted on the other hand if we see crime as something that you know is sort of out of your control being a criminal is sort of like being sick um then we might have a, a bit of a, both a policy and kind of moral problem here in that the most effective way to eradicate this disease might be to come in and lock people up. And, you know, um, Kennedy is, is very fond of sort of taking key people in criminal networks out of the community entirely and disrupting the operation of the network that way. It might still be effective, but it, but it seems less clearly warranted, right? Um, We've given up largely on forcibly quarantining people who have diseases, except in extreme emergencies, right? Maybe you think crime in American cities is an extreme emergency, right? But we've given up on this. I remember uh, some folks from SISM back when SARS was a thing. Some folks with SISM uh, had gone to a conference on dealing with dangerous pathogens with some representatives from the Chinese government. And when the issue of quarantining people who had communicable diseases came up, many of the people in the room from the U.S. and from Western countries said, oh, well, this is a real big problem, right? We might have to quarantine them for effectiveness, but it's really hard to justify quarantine in our kind of system. The Chinese basically said, well, what's the problem, right? Someone has a disease that's dangerous, we lock them up. This represents very deep differences in the two kinds of systems, but at least in our variety of democracy, it becomes very problematic to inflict harm on people if we've said they are not responsible in some fundamental way. Now, the flip side of this is if you see crime as a kind of pathology, you see violence as a kind of pathology, social disruption as a kind of disease, you might say, well, let's not punish it, let's address the root causes, right? If violence is caused by poverty, to oversimplify, right? But if violence is caused by poverty, why are we focusing our energies on locking up and punishing the people who commit violent acts, who we've just said are not in a full sense responsible for it? Um, why aren't we getting rid of the poverty? And part of the problem is that, well, getting rid of poverty is slow. It's difficult. Um, you know, if you want to say let's get the murder rate in Baltimore down by eradicating poverty, uh, that's probably going to take a lot longer time. Even if it's, in the long run, potentially more effective than locking up a whole bunch of murderers, it's probably going to take a lot longer time than doing this. Um, to go back to Ken Kennedy's uh, sort of interesting uh, analogy is, think about something like lung cancer, right? We can get rid of lung cancer by stopping everyone from doing, well, I don't think we can get rid of it. Cancer sometimes just happens, right? We get rid of a lot of lung cancer by getting everyone to stop smoking and stop doing other things that uh, contribute to cancer rates. Or we could try to cure lung cancer. Um, now, in reality, the policy world, you might need both at the same time. But, you know, there are, both is a nice answer, but again, to go back to the pathology kind of question, you might not like the idea of both if you think that crime is fundamentally a pathology, right? Um, now suddenly you're, you're, you're punishing people for something that is not in their control. The other side, and, and Kleine gets into this, is that if you really care about root causes, this pulls against the kind of neutral professional image of the police. If you really care about, po it's one thing for, if you're a police officer to say, all right, you know, my job is to go into this community and um, prevent violence. Even on a kind of community policing sort of picture, uh, you might be able to do that. You go in, you, you find out who is likely to be having disputes, who's got uh, arguments with whom, who's armed, who's dangerous, who's unstable, you know, what the problems are, you can go to fix them. But if you really start pushing towards root causes, this can get you involved in political controversy, right? One part of the problem with trying to solve crime by ending poverty is that that's going to be really slow or solving crime by ending racism, right? That's going to be really slow. The other part of it is that once you start trying to end poverty, you get involved in deeply political questions like, why is there poverty? You know, 
suddenly your you, suddenly your police officers may be trying to decide, you know, is capitalism ultimately damaging to society, or you know, does more personal responsibility need to be taken by people in 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 in, in poor communities? Uh, and so this this potentially pulls against the kind of neutral servant of the polity image that a lot of people have of both police and of the military. And, you know, as we talked about with role responsibilities of sort of civil servants generally, that they will protect the structure of the polity without becoming involved in the moral controversies um, that the polity is embroiled in. So there's that. A even deeper critique of this side of things is that <clears throat> a lot of people are concerned that policing and punishment might ultimately not serve moral ends, not make the society a morally better place, but might just enforce the status quo, enforce whatever hierarchies are already there in a invidious way. So one social contract model is locks. People who come together in society have various kinds of problems. You need a state with police and military powers in order to protect them from outside threats and protect them from each other and resolve controversies. A different kind of social contract theory is Rousseau's. Rousseau sees the social contract essentially as a swindle that the rich perpetrate on the poor. Um, the rich worry that the poor will get together and take all of their stuff through force, so they cut a deal. They say, all right, how about this? We will not just unlimitedly, you know, we will place some limits on what the rich can accumulate. In return, uh, you poor people give up the right to violently expropriate us um, by supporting, you know, putting all the, the legitimate force in the hands of a police force. Uh, Rousseau thinks this is a bad deal for the poor. Um, a lot of thinkers have followed him on this. Uh, you know, and there are a lot of folks who think that whatever the ideals, the social contract ideals of a police force might be, or a punishment system might be, in the real world, what happens is these systems tend to reinforce existing and potentially morally invidious social and power hierarchies um, at the expense of justice, rather than preventing them. Um, in the most extreme case, so in the moderate versions of this, the idea is that uh, the rules of the game tend to favor the elites in a system. And so enforcing the status quo is kind of, let's quit while I'm ahead. Uh, in the more extreme cases, yeah, but there might still be some value to that, right? They do generally, genuinely produce order. In the more extreme cases, uh, or more extreme versions of this theory, it's the state structure and the policing system itself that creates some of the problems, right? So Foucault talks about the penal system essentially creating a reserve underclass that is necessary for the state to operate. You know, if we didn't have criminals, someone would have to invent them, uh, sort of idea. Alexander thinks that... Um, the racial elements of the U.S. penal system are not an unfortunate side effect of the way it encounters the racialized poverty that we have in the U.S., but actually there by design. Um, it's the intent of the system to reinforce a racial hierarchy. It's not just an unfortunate way that it operates in a place with a racial hierarchy. Now, there are a few mechanisms through which this, this might operate, through which policing might undermine whatever kind of morally ideal picture we have of it. One is that police and p corrections folks involved, are they're no less biased than anyone else. And the fact that, first of all, in our society, we give them a significant amount of discretion officially, and second of all, being the only person who's allowed to carry a weapon in the area, de facto gives you a lot of leeway, right? People are not going to talk back to the person with a gun. Um, the, the, the scope of action that police and folks involved in punishment have can give powerful opportunities for them to exercise their bias, even unconsciously, right? So take things like questions about racial profiling. Um, there are probably plenty of police who don't think of themselves as racist, but when they see a black person, 
are more likely to get that gut feeling that they might be up to something no good than when they see a white person. Um, you know, we talked about the implicit association test a while ago in, in, in class, and there's that sort of thing going on. Um, corrections facilities. Both my parents worked in corrections facilities uh, for their careers. I can tell you, prisons in a lot of ways are law-free zones. Um, people in prison are not politically popular. They don't have a lot of political clout. And so there's a lot of people who feel like whatever happens to someone in prison is kind of their own you know, what they deserve. This gives the correctional officers, especially, lots of leeway to exercise whatever bias they might have. So you might get reinforcement of social hierarchy through policing and prison systems just by the fact that the police, the guards in the prisons, buy into the biases implicit in the social hierarchy and, you know, have discretion to use them and the force to back it up. The laws themselves, even if the police and the Prisoner, prison guards and whoever are operating as sincerely and neutrally as possible, the laws themselves may reflect social bias. Um, this is what Rousseau thought the laws of property reflected. There's a very, very strong rule that you're not allowed to take anyone else's stuff, combined with only a very weak rule that you must contribute to the social good. Right? This setup of laws uh, favors the wealthy. Uh, the quip is that the um, you know the law prevents the rich and poor alike from sleeping under bridges. You know, vagrancy laws are not going to hurt me as long as I keep my job. They're going to hurt poor people. Uh, policy thing. One of the things war on drugs is often uh, accused of this. Uh, a lot of people have talked about the sentencing um, the sentencing guideline differences between crack and cocaine. Uh, if you are selling crack or you are buying crack, there are very, in the U.S., there are very hefty minimum sentences associated with this, uh, less than the sentences associated with buying or selling powdered cocaine. And one of the arguments is that, why is this? Well, crack is associated with, with use by blacks, powdered cocaine is associated with use by relatively wealthy whites, um, and so the bias against blacks and towards relatively wealthy whites is built into the laws themselves. So when police enforce those laws, they are not promoting justice, they are reinforcing a social hierarchy that led to these, these, uh, these laws. Um, and finally, it may operate through the laws, not so much having social bias necessarily, but through a slightly different thing of privileging social order over justice. In a society that is only imperfectly just, seeking justice may require social disruption. If we see laws and law enforcement as primarily a matter of preserving the peace and preserving order at all costs, um, this will, you know, unsurprisingly tend to reinforce order sometimes at the expense of justice. And some people have pointed to actual police activities as showing that the police care more about order than justice. Uh, <clears throat> David Kennedy in his book says, look, Nobody cares about crime. If you cared about crime, there's crime all over. Uh, we wouldn't be deploying police primarily to uh, black neighborhoods in the cities if we cared about crime. Even if we cared about drug crime, right? There's statistical evidence that more white people proportionally use drugs than black people. Nonetheless, more black people are in prison for, for drug crimes. Uh, why is this? Kennedy has the moderately benign view that what we do, we care about social order um, more than we care about crime. So we go and bust up crack dealers because they're the ones standing on corners. Um, we go into poor neighborhoods because they're the ones that have drug dealers standing on corners. Uh, we don't come into white suburban neighborhoods because there the drug dealers are behind closed doors, they're not out on the street, they're not disrupting anything, they're not causing a nuisance. Um, but this is really shows a favoring of preserving the peace, preserving order over any kind of getting rid of crime sort of idea. Uh, another example from the past year is the dealing with the, with the Occupy Wall Street movement, right? There is a little bit, if you looked at things purely as police being there to enforce the laws and prevent crime, some of this looked a little bit weird, right? The official reason why, um, protesters were evicted from a lot of areas was that they were illegally camping. 
you know, so we sent in police, of course, with pepper spray and riot gear and batons and rubber bullets and tear gas and, you know, armored vehicles and all sorts of stuff to break this up. And a lot of people, if you're looking at this from a crime perspective, they're going to say, wait a second. You know, really, we need the riot police to stop the, the horrible scourge of illegal camping? You know, if you polled Americans, you said, which crime problem is the most important? Very few people would say illegal camping is up there, right? We don't have this kind of response to, um, you know, rapes, for instance, right? We don't send out hundreds of police in riot gear to try to stop rape. Um, but we do do it to stop illegal camping. And the argument would be that this is represents a structural institutional bias towards preserving order, stopping social disruption, even when it might be merited, even when you're civil rights activists sitting down doing sit-ins at lunch counters um, over any kind of promotion of justice. The police are not there to promote justice. They're there to preserve order. And, you know, if the order is bad, if the status quo is bad, they're there reinforcing the existing status quo whatever the ideal of the system might be. So are there alternatives? Um, lots have been proposed, both from a policing and, um, sorry, a policy and uh, sort of academic, uh, theoretical, moral perspective. And when I say alternatives, I mean alternatives to using institutions who make heavy use of force and coercion um, as their tools. Things have been, different things have been proposed to maintain order. Uh, one way of doing this might, through, might be through using a lot of mediation. This is often proposed for violence, things like gang violence. Um, things like the Chicago ceasefire model de-emphasize any kind of punishment. They are primarily focused on nipping violence in the bud before it happens. They use... Uh, if, if, you, if you're interested in this, there, there's actually a documentary movie called The Interrupters about this. They use people who are violence interrupters, who go out into the community, try to identify situations that may turn violent and defuse them, get people to walk away, um, get people to solve their differences, uh, get people to stand down or calm down when emotions run high. Uh, you know, there's some, there's some evidence that this works. There's also some theory behind it. Uh, it turns out that even in places where there's a lot of criminal activity, most of the violence is not calculated that way, right? If you've watched The Wire, it's a good show, but you've gotten a slightly misleading perspective on why there's violence. In The Wire, 99% of the time, somebody gets killed, it's because there was, you know, a calculating gang kingpin who was eliminating the opposition. In the real world, a lot of the time when somebody gets killed, it might be gang-related in the sense that they were in a gang, uh, but a lot of times people get, get killed, well, somebody was having an argument and tempers ran high and somebody had a weapon nearby. Uh, there's a book by another Baltimore police officer called Why Do We Kill that has, he was a homicide detective, has a number of case studies about homicides he worked. Zero percent of them are the result of somebody calculatedly killing someone in furtherance of a criminal enterprise, right? 100% of them are the result of people in bad situations with often with limited emotional or social resources and access to weaponry. Um, so trying to see these things as, especially this associated with the pathology view, seeing these things as operations for mediation and de-escalation rather than for using force to, you know, lock up somebody who is who is violent is one kind of model. Another kind of view often associated with the first one is, is to go after the root causes. To say, let's stop spending as much money on crime uh, in terms of in, in terms of policing and punishment and more on poverty reduction, more on amelioration of social problems. Um, more on educating people. Uh, you know, there's a very strong policy strand that says fundamentally the problem of crime is a problem of poverty and, and, and education. If we had a, a more equitable material situation and we educated people better, we would not have the kinds of social disruption that people uh, want heavy police presence to deal with. And then especially for um, victimless, so-called victimless crimes, uh, there's some dispute about whether they're really victimless. We can get into that. But um, 
And in the U.S., especially, especially for drug crimes, there's a view that, well, maybe what we should do is just decriminalize certain kinds of disruption entirely. We may not like drug use, but treating it as a crime to be punished may be the wrong kind of model for reducing the social disruption and maintaining order. We may not be thrilled about prostitution, but maybe um, <coughs> treating prostitutes as people who are caught in bad situations rather than as criminals would actually help us fix the problems more than treating it as a crime. Uh, so this is kind of harm reduction strategies, especially for drugs. This is a really popular uh, policy alternative. For drugs, this is the route that many European countries have followed this route for drugs much more than uh, the U.S. has. The U.S. has, you know, it's not like we don't have any drug treatment, but we focused, in our concern about drugs, we have focused the, the, the lion's share of our resources on coercive enforcement. In Europe, they have focused uh, much larger shares of their resources on harm mitigation, treatment programs, educational programs, and that sort of thing. On the punishment side, on the sort of balancing moral accounts side, um, in our system, we use fines and prison very heavily with uh, the death penalty, at least in the US, uh, as sort of the ultimate sanction. But there are other kinds of pictures. Uh, you could have a situation where some kind of restitution or community service or rec reconciliation process uh, was the default punishment, the default way that you dealt with people who committed crimes. Uh, this is not terribly popular in Western democracies, but this is the route that's been followed, for instance, by lots of post-war criminal approaches. Uh, in a place like Rwanda, where they, um, well, all right, I don't want to sidetrack this into complexities of the Kakaka system in Rwanda, right? But in a place like Rwanda, <coughs> or in South Africa, or in Liberia, where so many people were involved in crimes and the crimes were so pervasive and structural that it seemed inappropriate, implausible, odd, misguided, counterproductive to try to try everyone individually in a Western style kind of, you know, criminal justice punishment system. Uh, there have been been, this is the genesis of things like like the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission in South Africa, where you focus on bringing about reconciliation rather than punishing the wrongdoer. Some societies, uh, not so much modern uh, Western societies, uh, have focused on other kinds of um, punishment. So shaming or marking, right? Uh, okay, we all know I'm a liberal. This American Life, I uh, think a week ago, two weeks ago maybe, was talking about a judge in Florida who would make thieves go stand outside of places they robbed, holding a sign saying, I stole from this place, right, to try to get the social sanction of shame. Uh, once upon a time, people might be marked in a more permanent way as a way of embedding shame, right? We don't, we don't brand people anymore that might on balance be a good thing, but it's a different kind of, but it is a kind of different model of punishment where you, you are, uh, you know, Foucault is obsessed with this, right? Where you're physically marking someone with the power of the state as a way of um, showing them to be evil, showing them to be outcast or problematic. Um, corporal punishment. We use very little corporal punishment in the in the U.S. Uh, other countries make more extensive use of it. We tend to think of it as cruel, um, except you know, death penalty is a kind of corporal punishment, but. There have been people who have proposed that this might be actually a better model, right? Um, it might be more appropriate to give someone a flogging or whatever than to lock them up, right? Especially given, this is another thing we haven't talked about, but especially given sort of issues about conditions in prisons in, in the U.S. and in a lot of countries. Um, there was a, uh, I don't think terribly good, which is why I didn't assign it to you, but much talked about article uh, a couple months ago in N plus one magazine called Raise the Crime Rate that advocated for, you know, getting rid of prisons because there are problems with them. Um, we can talk more about this. I mean, we barely even touched on Foucault's stuff of the dysfunctionality of prisons, but getting rid of them and replacing them with, you know, 
both accepting more risk, moving away from the kind of waste management model where the prison system is intended to keep anyone dangerous out of society. So accepting that more criminals, people who might potentially become do criminal acts again would be part of our society, but making more, you know, arguing we should make more extensive use of the death, the death penalty. Forget putting people in prison, just execute more people. Use floggings, use other kinds of non-imprisonment kinds of responses. People will propose this. Um, and of course, if you think of crime as primarily a pathology, maybe what you should replace punishment with is nothing. Right? Maybe people just don't merit punishment. We should, you know, educate them, we should deal with them. Um, we should maybe some in some extreme cases restrain them, and there's a whole separate thing we could talk about about detaining people who are dangerous through no fault of their own, typically people who have mental illnesses. Um, but you know, maybe we just shouldn't do anything. We should replace punishment with nothing. Um, and then attached to all of these is what role, if any, is there for formal police or correctional institutions in these kinds of alternative strategies? If we move towards a strategy where we primarily deal with violence through you know, reducing poverty and trying to mediate violent situations, do we still have police? Do we still have something that looks like a police system? Do we maybe keep it but radically change it, right? That might be a more live policy option for anyone who's interested in this sort of thing. All right, so to summarize, because this has already taken long enough, there's a multitude of possible understandings of the relationship between the kind of, broadly speaking, social contract, the uh, legitimate binding force of society and the use of force internal to that society. Social peacekeeping, law enforcement, suppression of, 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 of disruption. Um, and how that relationship is understood, how you understand what the use of force is for, and how it relates to our purposes in building a society in the first place, is going to shape what kinds of policing, law enforcement, punishment policies seem justified. You know, whether or not you think that it's going to shape whether or not you think the state ought to be in the business of morality, making people better people, or whether the state is just there to, you know, deter disruptions to the existing order, whatever that order might be. Um, and that brings us to the, to the final and one of the deeper questions that there may be tension in a lot of situations. All of our societies are imperfectly just at best. And so there may be tension between preserving order and promoting justice in some broader sense. Let's hope the tension is not too great.